my duty today is to introduce our first speaker, the Right Honourable Michael Gove MP, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Minister for the Cabinet Office. Um, I, I, I certainly always found myself asked when I was doing that job in government, what does it actually involve? And the truth is that um, Michael is responsible for a department that is, in essence, the, the sort of intelligence um, and functional centre of government that deals with uh, the government commercial and digital services, that coordinates the work of cabinet and cabinet committees. And he also has particular responsibilities for constitutional affairs, including uh, oversight of devolution and relations with uh, the devolved governments. But also uh, the, the, the cabinet office minister tends to take on sort of troubleshooting roles um, at the request of the prime minister to try to sort out uh, difficulties in different parts of government. But of course, critically for today, the National Security Advisor and the National Security Secretariat sit in the Cabinet Office and therefore Mr Gove has a, a very close interest in the development of the integrated review and its implementation as we look forward. <laughs> so <clears throat> very much like to welcome Michael today. I think his track record as a, a politician and a minister needs um, no introduction from me. We look forward to what you have to say. And then when you have spoken, um, I, we, Michael and I will engage in a conversation for a bit. And after that is uh, over, I will moderate, try to draw in questions from uh, participants uh, in, in the wider audience. And you're very welcome to put your questions uh, to Mr. Gove um, on the Q&A uh, sort of the, the function of the, of Zoom. I, I think I, exceptionally today, um, I think because of the size of the audience or anything else, it, I, we will treat questions and answers as on the record, um, so without Chatham House rule, and um, then the minister knows you know, exactly the terms of trade and, and so does everybody asking questions. Um, Michael, you're very, very welcome. We look forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, uh, Rusi today will be looking at uh, every aspect of the integrated review um, and particularly looking at the way in which uh, we're preparing uh, our own home team, uh, everyone within the civil service and everyone in the in the broader uh, national security community for the challenges ahead. Um, and uh, a few things I just wanted to stress at the beginning. The first is, of course, um, that um, we we meet um, just a few weeks after the uh, the sad uh, passing of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, um, and he gave a landmark address to Rusi in 1983, outlining uh, his thinking um, about uh, uh, the way in which we could train those, particularly in the armed forces, uh, for the challenges of the future. Um, and uh, reading his lecture, I have to confess, for the first time earlier this week, I was struck by how prescient. Uh, many of the points that he made were. And I know that um, we'll uh, have a chance to reflect on some of those lessons a little bit later, and that my colleague Pamela Dow, a brilliant civil servant who's been put in charge of the uh, government curriculum and skills team, um, will be saying a little bit more about that. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to stress, first of all, is that while it's critically important uh, that we recognise that there is a, uh, a a role for and the need for uh, reviewing how we train those in the armed forces and how we provide them with the skills necessary. As everyone on this call will appreciate, uh, those involved in national security extend beyond the armed forces. And it's not just the security and intelligence services, it's also those who are involved increasingly um, in resilience uh, who play a part in national security overall. Our understanding of national security evolves over time. And one of the things which I think has certainly been uh, reinforced by the experience, uh, the sad experience of the last uh, year and a bit, is that threats to our uh, security um, are uh, evolving and proliferating. Um, and so there are, there are threats from uh, 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 natural events, uh, the pandemic, uh, global warming, which of course is um, uh, uh, accelerated by man's own activities um, and other uh, natural events. But it's also the case that there are a range of new and even more significant threats to our security, um, which are enabled by technology, 
So it, it is in particular the case, as, uh, as everyone on this call will be aware, um, that cyber is a domain in which um, uh, new threats and, and indeed new opportunities exist. Um, those new threats, I think, have been uh, uh, vividly brought to our mind by, for example, some of the ransomware attacks that have recently been launched, including indeed on um, uh, Ireland's own health service. Um, and the, uh, the scale and nature of that threat is one that uh, we absolutely require to better understand, because it's not just the case that cyber experts are involved in keeping us all safe. There are basic hygiene uh, decisions that every government department and all those of us involved in uh, making sure that our country is resilient have to be aware of as well. Similarly, there are uh, biosecurity threats as well, as uh, technology allows us uh, to develop uh, new opportunities to uh, uh, in fields like agriculture and in life sciences, uh, to increase production and to increase longevity, it is also the case that there are bio threats and biohazards um, which hostile actors can generate as well in order to um, uh, undermine or potentially threaten our security. Um, and indeed, uh, there are other uh, examples of uh, what one might call information warfare or uh, uh, opportunities which, uh, as we know, actors like uh, uh, Russia undertake in order to try to interfere both with the integrity of our democracy and also to use social media platforms and others to try to skew the debate. So uh, that, uh, uh, that broader range of threats needs to be understood across government. So uh, within the cabinet office, as you know, David, having uh, uh, led it, uh, there is a unit which looks at how we defend democracy, um, which looks specifically at how we ensure the integrity of the electoral process, uh, something which um, uh, uh, we have to remain constantly uh, vigilant towards, um, and it's a new area, and those involved, uh, you know, 20 years ago in delivering our elections would not have thought that they were involved in a, a critical area vulnerable to attack from others, and therefore they wouldn't necessarily have thought of themselves as part of our broader national security team. But we do have to think in that way now. Similarly, those who are involved in uh, uh, the delivery of uh, of basic aspects of our infrastructure. Those involved in, in running the national grid, for example, would have been unlikely to have thought of themselves as part of uh, uh, you know, the national security community uh, a few years ago or two decades ago, uh, a, save in the circumstances of a, an all-out war or a, um, a full-scale assault. But now we know that uh, 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 efforts by uh, hostile states and indeed by others to undermine um, uh, parts of our critical national infrastructure um, are, uh, are real threats for which we all need to be um, aware. Um, and also, it is the case that, as well as hostile state actors, there are non-state actors uh, that uh, are intent on subverting our security. Two things I would say. Uh, it is welcome that instances of international uh, terrorism, Islamist terrorism, are diminishing at the moment in the West, or have been diminishing, but we must remain vigilant. But it's also the case that there are other actors as well. There are uh, extreme right-wing identitarian uh, terrorists about whom we need to be increasingly um, aware. And it's also the case that there are anarchist and organized crime groups who will be using some of these new platforms and new techniques, which means that all of government needs to think about national security in a way that it might not have done before. And what Pamela's team will be doing is making sure that people have uh, the knowledge required to be aware of where these threats come from and how to make sure that we uh, better protect our national infrastructure and our citizens, um, uh, that they develop the skills required in order to uh, navigate these new waters, and also that they uh, uh, cultivate the networks required as well, so that um, uh, the expertise that exists in institutions like uh, GCHQ and in the armed forces and in the broader uh, resilience community um, uh, are shared in a way that allow us to think holistically. Um, the integrated review is part of that process, um, and one final thing I would say about the integrated review is that it builds on um, the principle of fusion, um, uh, which, uh, again, I know that you were instrumental in helping to lead when Theresa was prime minister in making sure that we think about our diplomatic, our development um, and our defence assets as uh, coming together in order to ensure uh, that the interests of the UK um, and our values um, are protected and projected as effectively as possible. Um, I'll stop there. I hope that's helpful. Um, and I'm very, very happy, David, to take any questions from you and from other colleagues. Michael, thank you very, very much indeed for the stimulating introduction. Um, and um, 
uh, the, uh, some questions are coming in. I'd really encourage um, members of the audience use that Q&A function and I will try to get through as many questions as uh, we can. And I shall um, at about um, in about 20 minutes, perhaps turn to to Pamela and um, sort of ask her to speak as as, as well. Um, the can we start off, Michael? Um, to look at look at the um, the relationship between government and the private sector here. That that you know the uh, the private sector obviously carries out a lot of work <coughs> on behalf of government, and our adversaries are going to be targeting private as well as public sector entities. And as the pandemic and the vaccine uh, program has shown, the private sector is also going to be a key element in uh, our response, a, su a successful response to pandemics. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you intend to try to build in to the, the overall strategic management of government private sector relationships? This, greater awareness of, of national security and a greater capacity for addressing the issues you've described. Well, I think that's absolutely spot on, David. I mean, uh, it, it's impossible to deliver all of the services for which government is responsible and which citizens expect without the involvement of the private sector. And as you quite rightly point out, um, the success of the vaccines programme is dependent on intense collaboration there. And there are a number of risks and dangers. Um, one is uh, intellectual property theft. Uh, so uh, it, it is the case either through uh, uh, traditional uh, or modern espionage techniques, but also through the commercial acquisition of uh, UK uh, companies that hostile actors attempt to, to steal our intellectual uh, property and to um, acquire, in some cases, some of our um, you know, scientific and commercial crown jewels. So one thing that we need to do, and of course legislation is going through at the moment, is to be in a stronger position to prevent uh, uh, takeovers or the acquisition of those assets by uh, countries or organizations uh, who don't have our best interests at heart. The second thing is, you're right, increasing awareness um, ac across uh, the private sector of the threats that they themselves face. Um, and there is a problem here in that um, if you as an institution uh, are subject to a ransomware attack, um, then it may well be the case that the temptation is to pay up, keep Sturm um, and uh, uh, not alert uh, your customers and clients or others to the fact that you've been exposed to this vulnerability um, because the, the reputational hit might be greater than the, uh, the cash that you hand over. So one of the things that we have to do is to make sure that there is an understanding that uh, uh, the, the right thing to do is to cooperate with government if you are subject to these sorts of attacks because um, uh, one vulnerability in one particular area can lead to a greater degree of uh, chaos and damage uh, uh, across the sector. And it's making sure that people understand the importance of collective action. And then the third thing is just making sure that people are properly aware of the, uh, the risks, cyber risks particularly. Um, and there is a, uh, I think, a growing determination on the part of government to make sure that those parts of the private sector that are vulnerable to these assaults understand what it is necessary to do in order to protect oneself. So uh, it is absolutely critical. And, and as I say, um, there is still some way to go before we can make sure that the uh, understanding of the ris these risks is properly socialized across the whole of the private sector. How do, how do, you, I mean, how do you assess the, the, the level of private sector awareness of the risks and of their responsibilities? You know, we've had uh, the National Cyber Security Center, take the obvious example, you know, mm. pushing the message out um, for you know, a few years. Now, I mean, do you sense this is getting through? And are there particular gaps that, that you would identify in, in private sector awareness? I think that awareness is increasing. I think that um, particularly in, amongst large corporates and those in the uh, financial services sector, there is, a, there is a good awareness of that. But I think that the awareness is not as strong as it should be. It's also the case that, <coughs> forgive me, as well as smaller actors in the private sector, it's also the case that there are some aspects of the public sector they're not as aware as they uh, should be. Um, um, and we've seen recently local government in particular uh, being an area of vulnerability to yes. um, uh, cyber attacks. So there is still more to do in order to make sure that people are aware of the dangers and take appropriate steps to protect themselves and others. In, 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 indeed. Um, and um, just, just I mean, 
or I don't want to stick to, to steal Pamela's thunder later on. If I ask at the strategic level about um, sort of education and, and uh, training mm. and sk skills more generally, um, is the government looking cross departmentally at uh, whether uh, the the T levels program, the apprenticeship program, um, perhaps even university or school uh, curricula could need to be changed in some way to take account of the importance of security skills as identified in the integrated review? Yes, we absolutely need to. And, and um, as you may know, we're, we're thinking about um, uh, expanding the work. In fact, we're committed to expanding the workforce in this area. And one of the things that we do need to do is to think hard about uh, the mix of skills that people will acquire, whether it's in school or in further and higher education that might equip them for uh, successful careers in this area. Um, and of course, we, uh, 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 during the coalition years, uh, overhauled the, the old um, uh, uh, ICT curriculum in order to upgrade it to computer science. Um, and I think that that has had a beneficial effect, but there is much more that we need to do. Um, and of course, one of the things that we're anxious to do is uh, when we think of some of the, the, the jobs that we're relocating as part of the Places for Growth programme, a programme of bringing government departments closer to different communities, one of the things that we're anxious to do is to make sure that we're locating key assets close to centres of excellence in areas like uh, 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 cyber and computer science and other areas. Um, what I should stress, and everyone on this call will be aware, that it's not just STEM subjects that are uh, uh, useful tools and useful ways of um, uh, acquiring uh, competence and skill in this area. It is often the case that people who will have studied subjects like modern foreign languages will have the the sort of um, uh, the intellectual background that will enable them then to master some of the skills that are required in the professional field that uh, uh, that can help us um, to augment our uh, security capability. Uh, but it's certainly the case that, uh, uh, as I say at the moment, when we're thinking about uh, the future of our national cyber force and where it should be located, that we're thinking hard about exactly where we can find people with the skills required in order to, um, uh, to join. The, the only other thing that I would say is that um, I was in Israel recently. Um, uh, I was there principally in order to look at their vaccination program and COVID recovery. But also while there, we had the opportunity to talk to a variety of um, individuals in the um, uh, in the world of cyber and cyber security. Um, and again, one of the things that, that Israel has been very successful at is talent spotting. So whether it's through the Talpia program or um, other schemes, it, it's been able to provide those with the skills and aptitude necessary and opportunity to spend time uh, uh, in government and in the defence world. And of course, as we know, one of Israel's strengths has been the throughput from school through university to uh, uh, elite uh, defense and cyber programs, and then people spinning out into uh, the, uh, uh, the tech sector as entrepreneurs. Um, and I think that there's much that we can learn from their example in how we can ensure that there's a, a career path that combines public service and then subsequent innovation. Thank you. Let's, let's move to some of the questions that have been uh, sent in. Um, pu public um, awareness and, 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 and uh, public support. I mean, two linked questions here. Dick Rogers is saying, is there a job to do to identify and win the whole population to a unifying national objective? And Kirsty Hunter says the public have an increasingly significant role in national security, uh, given what's already been mentioned in terms of cyber and information warfare. How can we increase resilience and awareness of their role amongst the general public? Well, I think uh, I've got two very, very important points. I think that um, uh, increasing public awareness of the nature of these risks is critical because the point that, uh, that you quite rightly made earlier is that it's not just those within the traditional national security or resilience community who play a role. Uh, there would be people in uh, all parts of government and in many parts of the private sector. Uh, who will uh, uh, be in a uh, uh, potentially exposed position um, unless we have um, a, a level of understanding which enables people to, to do the right thing in those circumstances and to play their part. Um, and there is a programme of education that is required because I think that the, the understanding of the nature of these threats is uh, imperfect. Um, our, our, our former colleague, uh, Oliver Letman, uh, recently wrote a novelized account, um, mm. Apocalypse How, of what the impact of uh, uh, 
uh, a particularly powerful cyber attack on the UK might be. Um, and I think that it's also the case that uh, people like Toby Ord have been writing about some of the, the specific dangers that we face in a way which has brought them to um, a wider understanding in the New York Times, I think it's the New York Times, but the American writer Nancy Perlroth has uh, written a compelling book which uh, outlines some of the cyber dangers. Um, so there is a wider understanding, but I think for, uh, uh, for some, it will all seem a little bit abstract, a little bit techy, a little bit difficult to comprehend. Um, and improving understanding, I think, is absolutely critical to making sure that people appreciate the, uh, 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 the nature of the threat to the way that we, uh, the way that we live. Thank you. Can, can we move just to, to the, the issue of a national security college, which, which was yes. an idea mentioned in the integrated review? And I think uh, I'm interested to, to know what the government's current thinking is about that. And there's a particular question from uh, Jörg Schimmelpfennig, who says, um, who do you want to attend a potential national security college? Would it be just for say, members of the armed forces, police forces and so on? Or would it be open to the wider public like uh, any other university course? Um, I, th I think it's somewhere between the two at this stage. So as well as obviously being somewhere that you'd have people from um, the traditional security um, organizations, military and so on, I think you would also, we would also expect that uh, we would have people from uh, uh, the police and fire services who operate as the gold commanders in uh, each of our uh, 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 local resilience fora. Um, I think it would also be the case that you would have people at every level from uh, different government departments. So you would expect to have people from Bayes who are responsible for the energy sector, people from the Department for Environment who are dealing with uh, uh, climate change mitigation uh, and adaptation. Um, and I think you would also expect to see uh, people from, uh, uh, certainly from the Home Office who are dealing with um, um, a, a range of potential uh, organized crime and other threats. Um, and I would also suspect that it would be the sort of thing that uh, 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 every government department uh, without wanting to preempt things would probably need to have at, at the very least a director, if not a director general, who's uh, across these particular issues. Um, and we would expect that they would spend time uh, uh, studying and assessing these risks and how to deal with them. Um, but ideally, um, and, and it will be uh, for Pamela to propose and for ministers to consider, uh, the broader the range of uh, organisations who can benefit from this particular form of um, uh, uh, collaborative learning, the better. Thank you. Um, it's a question here from Sevi, who, who says that commercial businesses are busy disrupting the norm, re keep releasing new products and services into the, into the market, which perhaps inadvertently introduce numerous weaknesses into the mm. infrastructure and consumers unwittingly aid hostile actors with poor home routers, IoT devices, weakening uh, gas and electricity meters, traffic lights and so on. Um, and, and, and what Sevi asks is, should the government not introduce some kind of red, of, of some kind of kite flag symbol registration for secure products and electronic services that, that meet um, a, 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 a requirement of, of, on security to the government's satisfaction? Um, I think that is a very good challenge. Um, I, uh, as with all policy suggestions, um, there may be unintended consequences that flow from that. It may be that in signaling what is safe and what is unsafe, that we reveal too much of our own hand. But, but um, I, I would have to say that I think that it is a, uh, a very, very sensible proposition, be precisely because in a sophisticated, highly networked uh, uh, you know, uh, space such as the United Kingdom, uh, then there are a host of vulnerabilities um, which people may unwittingly uh, 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 exacerbate by the decisions that, uh, that all of us make. And I think a better understanding of these risks, just as in the course of the last year, if, it, if it's not too facile a comparison, we've all developed a far more sophisticated understanding of some of the risks that come from uh, pandemics would be a very good thing. Got a question from uh, Julia who, who says national security investment bill um, is all very well and good, but there's lots of SMEs uh, who are developing technology who don't understand the current UK export control regime, let alone a new, the new, let alone new reporting requirements. Mm. And what's the government plan to do to address a pretty immediate need for knowledge and understanding, um, as well as of what will be needed in the future, particularly when you're dealing with um, 
very small, often micro businesses. Well, it's a critical point, and and, and it is often the case that uh, it is some of those very small businesses which um, uh, will be developing the uh, the services and products which will be critical to enhancing our security in the future, but which will also be of greatest interest to hostile actors. Um, and the team in the Cabinet Office that was responsible for scrutinising this area has moved two bays. I believe it's been expanded, and I believe part of the reason for uh, the movement and the expansion is in, in order to ensure that uh, we uh, contact and make uh, businesses aware of uh, some of the challenges and responsibilities, and particularly, of course, those businesses which are in uh, 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 the tech area, in AI and so on, uh, that are likely to attract the, the greatest level of hostile interest. Michael Eccleshaw from your Cabinet Office team uh, oh, yes. says that there's a significant difference in undertaking resilience-related work in a crisis response situation mm. as compared with business as usual, and the two functions require different skill sets, particularly in terms of working at significant pace with imperfect information and uh, w w without always being able to know exactly what the immediate impact will be of the decisions you take. And does, he asks, does the way the civil service is structured with people frequently moving in and out of resilience and crisis uh, related roles, does that create a problem? And would you support the notion that all civil servants should at the very least have to undertake some foundational knowledge, um, skills and behaviours based training uh, about how to work in a crisis? Uh, not necessarily all, but certainly many more. And I think that Michael makes a very good point. Um, and uh, two things that I would stress. One is that um, uh, to, to use a phrase from boxing, uh, train hard, fight easy. Um, the more it is that we can have uh, exercises, simulations, opportunities for individuals uh, to uh, experience um, and to uh, uh, you know uh, have a uh, uh, a real life role playing uh, a situation in which they can assess how we respond to these challenges, the better. It not only increases awareness, but it also develops exactly the habits of uh, relatively rapid decision taking, crisp information sharing, and so on that we need. Um, uh, but also allied to that, allied to uh, acquiring habits through uh, those sorts of exercises which are necessary. I think it is also the case that there is a, a foundational base of knowledge exactly, um, uh, as Michael says, that we do need to make sure that more and more people have across departments because uh, being aware of uh, when uh, uh, the red light is flashing, uh, what uh, 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 the threshold may be when something moves from a distant risk to a real a clear and present danger, I think is critical as well. I think this will have to be the last question before I turn to Pamela, but Paul O'Neill says that effective strategy measured through its implementation is often as much behavioural yes. as it is about the brilliance of the, the, the writing of the plan. And that involves soft skills like listening, empathy and persuasion. The skills are individual, largely, but successful strategy is hugely collaborative. So the profession should be as much a collective challenge as about individual skills. And how do you envisage this balance of hard and soft skills and individual and collective capacity playing out in your work? Well, um, uh, I, I think, again, that's an absolutely critical point. So um, uh, there, is, there is no perfect uh, uh, line, dividing line, no clear, bright line between hard and soft skills because uh, some of the habits necessary in order to acquire hard skills, uh, the, uh, the self-discipline, the application, the grit, as it were, contribute to softer skills as well. But one of the institutions, perhaps unsurprisingly to a Rusi audience, uh, which I believe captures this best, is Sandhurst. Um, part of it is in my constituency. I've had the privilege of visiting it often. And one of the things that it does teach is leadership. Now, leadership seems in many respects like a, um, an abstract virtue composed of soft skills. But in fact, what Sandhurst has done successfully over time, and it continues to adapt and to evolve, is to inculcate in all those who go through it um, a set of habits, a set of responses, a, um, a, a way of asking questions, a way of responding to events that collectively comes together uh, as um, uh, uh, leadership ability. Um, and I think part of that, yes, is listening. It's being able to 
absorb information quickly. It's being able to adjust to new information and to uh, develop between yourself and those with whom you work the fastest possible feedback loop and the greatest possible uh, uh, openness to challenge consistent with then taking a decision and executing it um, in a, uh, 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 a smart and effective and rapid way. Um, one can develop manuals, one can develop um, uh, uh, playbooks, but ultimately uh, it is only through uh, uh, cooperation. I mentioned earlier uh, role playing, but there are other ways in which you can, uh, and exercises, which I think are integral, but there are other ways in which you can inculcate these habits as well. Um, but as I say, um, uh, both Pamela and I are huge admirers of the way in which Sandhurst operates. And while its method of uh, training uh, young men and women is not immediately replicable in other areas, it has a lot to teach us. Michael, thank you very much. You're, and, and you're, please, you're very welcome, uh, if you can, to stay on till 11 o'clock when this, this session will conclude. And um, um, I'll ask Pamela to speak and then we will go back to questions. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and so that some may fall to you rather than to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to Pamela. I shall, I shall, I shall uh, certainly remember, Michael, this, this, this session for the first time I've heard Michael go use uh, sort of boxing uh, advice as, as part of the presentation there. Um, but can I warmly welcome...